Good evening. It's Wednesday, July 3rd. I'm Max Pringle. President Biden today huddles with his campaign staff and with Democratic leaders, including 20 governors, to reassure them of his fitness to continue at the top of the Democratic ticket in this year's election. This follows his subpar performance at last week's presidential debate. Hurricane Barrel makes its way through the Caribbean as a deadly Category 4 storm. Jamaican officials declare a state of emergency ahead of the storm's arrival. British voters go to the polls Thursday in an election that's likely to end 14 straight years of Conservative Party rule. Wildlife conservationists are split over a federal plan to cull part of one owl species population to protect another threatened owl species. And the Oroville fire in Northern California continues to burn out of control and under intense heat. These stories and more coming up. This is the Pacifica Evening News from the studios of KPFA in Berkeley. I'm Max Pringle. President Biden and Vice President Kamala Harris today took part in a call with Democratic leaders and campaign officials in an effort to ease concerns over Biden's fitness to continue at the top of the ticket following his underwhelming performance at last week's debate. Biden also met with Democratic governors today. Benji Heyer has more. There's a real effort now to calm the waters just a day after the first Democrat congressman publicly called for Joe Biden to formally withdraw from the race for the Oval Office. The White House says it's looking to turn the page following his raspy, halting debate showing, whilst his campaign continues to downplay the crisis, insisting President Biden remains the nominee and Vice President Kamala Harris his running mate. But she now polls better than Biden in a matchup with Republican Party candidate Donald Trump. Benji Heyer, Washington. A group of Democratic governors say they're standing behind President Biden amid increasing calls from some in the party for him to leave the presidential race. Biden met for more than an hour at the White House in person and virtually with the more than 20 Democratic governors. The governors told reporters afterwards that the conversation was candid and they said that they expressed concerns about Biden's debate performance last week but they did not join other Democrats in urging him to leave the race. Maryland Governor Wes Moore said, quote, the president is our party leader, and added that in the meeting, Biden was clear that he was in the race to win. Some Democrats are calling for reforms to the Supreme Court in the wake of a ruling that presidents have broad immunity from prosecution, effectively derailing prosecution of former President Trump for his efforts to overturn his 2020 election loss to President Biden. Catherine Carley has more. New York Democratic Congressman Joe Morelli says he'll introduce a constitutional amendment to reverse the ruling. He says no one, not even the president, is above the law. There's no question that the president not only violated his oath of office, he precipitated an attack on the United States Capitol, on the Article One branch of government, the United States Congress. And I think there needs to be accountability for that. In light of the decisions and numerous scandals, House Democrats are pushing Republican Speaker Mike Johnson to allow a vote on court ethics, term limits, or expansion. Johnson seems highly reluctant. I'm Catherine Carley for Pacifica Network and Public News Service. Hurricane Barrel is roaring through the Caribbean as a deadly Category 4 storm today. The storm has killed at least seven people as the government of Jamaica declares a state of emergency ahead of the storm's impact on that island nation. Julie Walker reports. Jamaica, directly in the path of Burrell, a Category 4 hurricane packing 145 mile per hour winds. Prime Minister Andrew Holness. Jamaica must take this hurricane seriously. 
He's ordered a preemptive disaster declaration, and people have already been evacuating the island. The National Hurricane Center's Jack Bevan says conditions will be bad. Hurricane conditions, including uh, storm surge, heavy rains, and high winds. Burrow moves on to the Cayman Island, and then... We've got track guidance models that are anywhere from the central and upper Texas coast all the way down to the coast of eastern Mexico. But Bevan says it's still uncertain. Burl has killed at least six people and caused significant damage in the southeast Caribbean. I'm Julie Walker. A judge delayed President Trump's hush money sentencing Tuesday, putting it off until at least September to weigh the impact of the Supreme Court's recent ruling on presidential immunity. Julie Walker has more. And we'll have that story later. Today was the last day of campaigning before the British general election on Thursday. Polls show that the Labor Party is likely to unseat the Conservative Party by a wide margin. The Conservatives have held power for 14 years. More from Charles de la Desma. Voters in the UK are set to cast ballots in a national election on July 4, passing judgment on Prime Minister Rishi Sunak's 20 months in office and the four Conservative Prime Ministers before him. They're widely expected to do something they haven't done since 2005, elect a Labour Party government. Over the final days of the campaign, Sunak's insisted the outcome's not a foregone conclusion. Labour's also warning against taking the election result for granted. They're imploring supporters not to grow complacent about polls that have given the party a solid double-digit lead since before the campaign began. Charles Tilladesma, London. It is a big week for electoral politics in Europe. Voters in the UK and France, two of the continent's most important economies, are going to the polls this week. In Britain, the Labour Party looks poised to win big in the general election tomorrow. While in France, voters return for a second round of voting over the weekend as the country's far right scored big in the first round of parliamentary elections. I spoke with Dr. Matt Beach. He's a senior fellow at UC Berkeley's Institute of European Studies and is based in London. I started by asking him about the career of the likely next British Prime Minister, Labour's Keir Starmer. Yeah, he hasn't been in Parliament very long. He had a long and distinguished career as a senior lawyer. Uh, he's a King's Counsel. Uh, he was um, head of the um, Crown Prosecution Service for a number of years. And he, uh, he came into Parliament relatively recently, so less than a decade ago. And uh, he's a London MP. He's born and bred from a working class home, a blue collar home. But he went to a selective school uh, and then he went on to Leeds University to do a, uh, like a law degree. And then he did like a postgraduate law degree at Oxford and had a very distinguished law career. He was very, very left wing um, as a young man, um, not in the Labour Party, but in like socialist organisation and socialist legal organisations. And uh, he served under Jeremy Corbyn in Jeremy Corbyn's shadow cabinet. Jeremy Corbyn was leader of Labour for approximately five years. He was the most left-wing leader that Labour had in the present period, a member of the socialist campaign group on the Labour left. And so, so Keir Starmer was a bit of an unknown quantity because in many senses he's, he's kind of purged Corbyn and the left from uh, positions of note and, and power in the parliamentary Labour Party. And he's got very tough on a lot of the anti-Semitism that we very much see um, on, in, in, in Europe and Britain, particularly on the left. Uh, it, we see a lot of that. Um, and he's purged, he's purged that. Um, uh, and yet, um, we, he, we're not quite sure really where he stands on a, not, a number of issues. He's, he's been very adept at not being pigeonholed. He's been very adept at um, reaching out across kind of um, on wedge issues to different uh, sides of controversial questions. So I think um, this really is not an election where people are enthusiastically voting Labour, say, as they did in 97 for Tony Blair. 
This is more an election where they're really strongly voting against a conservative government that seems to be all out of ideas and has lost its reputation for governing competence. There's also been, hasn't there, some controversies. We've had the issue of party gate. We've had, um, you know, multiple prime ministers in just a couple of years. Um, what can you tell us about that? Yes, that's quite right. So we've had, you know, David Cameron and then we've had Theresa May. Boris Johnson, Liz Truss for about a month, and Rishi Sunak, so the Tories have gone through leaders. And mainly that's because of the internal machinations about Brexit and how so many Tory MPs did not want Brexit, even though the public wanted it, even though many centre-right and right-wing voters voted for it. A lot of Tory MPs didn't want it. And that has caused internal turmoil. And as you quite rightly say, then we had, once we, we, we left the EU formally at the end of January 2020, and then within six weeks we had COVID and we had the, with the shelter in place and the shutdowns. And uh, the first shutdown wasn't controversial, but the second and third very much were, and the public's mood moved against them. And um, Boris Johnson was eventually forced to resign because he broke he broke regulations. As did Rishi Sunak, as the Chancellor of the Exchequer, both of them um, received fines. Actually, they broke the regulations that they had actually set in the most controversial bill that we've had in Britain in a long time, the Coronavirus Act, which had rushed through Parliament in four days. It really was the biggest push of, of rights away from the citizen to the state in terms of stopping people going to church, uh, you know, masks, mask wearing, distance, uh, when a lot of the science was a little bit iffy about some of that. But, uh, and the opposition, it has to be said, uh, and the civil liberty heritage of the Labour Party went very much along with it. And actually, Sir Keir Starmer was calling for tighter and tighter regulations. And now in Europe, people feel very differently about that. And we, we kind of look back on those days with a modicum of embarrassment to some extent that we perhaps, um, we, we're counting the cost of those lockdowns in terms of teenage mental health and leaving seniors sort of stranded in care homes and things like that. And um, I guess the plus side about it was is the vaccine was got quite quickly and distributed to those who wanted it very quickly. So that was the upside. But unfortunately, the downside is very much in people's minds in Britain still and the impact, the damage it did to the poorest people in the economy and the lack of productivity, which caused surging inflation. And so that, I mean, when, when the hypocrisy of Boris Johnson breaking his own incredibly stringent regs around the Coronavirus Act, that has significantly dented people's regard for the Conservative Party. Let's shift gears a bit across the channel. Um, France is going to have a, a second round of parliamentary voting on Sunday. So many voters are sending a very clear message against the traditional sort of a conservative sort of Gaullists and the centrists and the social democrats saying that look if you can't get you know if you can't get a grip with the you know the two or three pressing public policy crises then we are going to vote for hard left and very hard right options and I think this is what you're seeing in France I think this is what you're seeing in other parts of Europe and and especially that's the issue in terms of mass migration uh, migration from around the world but particularly coming from Africa and the Middle East and uh, and elsewhere and I think you know just the fact that people feel that there is um, that many um, sort of uh, indigenous French people don't feel like they're getting a fair shake as President Obama would say a fair, a fair deal um, so that's, a, that's an issue of opportunity and prosperity. So I would say it's migration, it's opportunity and prosperity. And I think the other thing that is concerning people is law and order and crime. Um, and so what, what, you, what you've got, not just in France, but especially in France, uh, in the continent of Europe, is people, um, regular citizens who normally vote for centre-right and centre-left options, established parties, um, looking to the fringe hard left, hard right options. And um, yes, it's, uh, it's going to be one of the wake up calls, but I really don't think that's um, in any way comparable with what's happening in the United Kingdom. We're moving from a Conservative to a Labour Party. We're not moving from a, from a, from like a hard right party to sort of like a Marxist hard left party. And that's the voice of Dr. Matt Beach. He's a senior fellow at UC Berkeley's Institute of European Studies and is based in London. A judge delayed Trump's hush money sentencing on Tuesday, putting it off until at least September to weigh the impact of the Supreme Court's recent ruling on presidential immunity. More from Julie Walker. 
A major reprieve for Donald Trump sentencing in his hush money case now in September instead of next week following the Supreme Court ruling on presidential immunity. Fordham Law Professor Cheryl Bader. The Supreme Court's decision was a big win for Trump, but I don't see it having any effect on the constitutional validity of this verdict. But Trump's lawyers argue the Supreme Court ruling merits tossing out his conviction. Falsifying private business records to pay off a porn star would not fall within the outer perimeters of official presidential duties. The judge said he'd rule on September 6th and the next date in the case would be the 18th if necessary. Julie Walker, New York. President Joe Biden's troubled performance in last week's debate with Republican candidate and former President Donald Trump has sent Democrats and supporters of Biden's campaign into something of a tizzy. For some, it raises questions about age. Biden is 81, three years older than Trump. Now, some Democrats are calling for Biden to be replaced at the top of the ticket. For his part, Biden is saying he will not be forced out, and the Biden-Harris campaign is rushing to do damage control as the presidential race enters its final months. More on that from Christopher Martinez. The last sitting president to resign during a re-election campaign was Lyndon Baines Johnson back in 1968, just months before the election that was won by Richard Nixon. Fifty-six years later, and four months before the November elections, President Joe Biden is also facing calls to pull out of the race. This time, it's not because of a controversial war, but because of his disappointing performance in Thursday's debate against Donald Trump. First out of the gate was Democratic Congress member Lloyd Doggett of Texas. He spoke on CNN. We would be better off if we had a, a new candidate who could present a new vision for our country. Uh, and we can do that if we have an open and fair democratic process over the next few weeks. The calls have continued from other Democrats, like Ohio Democrat Tim Ryan, who called on Biden to rip the Band-Aid off and let Vice President Kamala Harris become the presidential candidate. Other Democrats have been more hesitant to call for change in the Democratic ticket. Virginia Democrat Jerry Connolly says he and most of his colleagues are still processing because they do not want to make decisions in haste or panic. I'm not going to jettison Joe Biden based on a 90-minute debate. Um, But I do want to be reassured that Joe Biden is capable of doing the job, wants to do the job, uh, and that he can reassure the public to both of those things. Despite the clamor from some Democrats, Biden is clear about his intentions. He reportedly joined a Zoom call with staff from the campaign and the Democratic National Committee, where he said, no one is pushing me out, I'm not leaving, I'm in this race to the end and we're going to win. He's also been making the rounds to reassure supporters. He met with House Democratic leader Hakeem Jeffries Tuesday, and he was scheduled to meet with Democratic governors Wednesday. This weekend, he'll sit for an interview with George Stephanopoulos, and he's taking his campaign to the key battleground states of Pennsylvania and Wisconsin. The campaign also sent out an all-staff memo aimed at calming fears. The memo cites internal tracking polls that show Biden only one percentage point behind Trump after the debate. Adrian Elrod is a senior spokesperson and advisor for the Biden-Harris campaign. And voters in this election will ultimately decide. We have seen from our internal polling that there has not been much of a shift. We have seen in eight public polls that this race remains within the margin of error and that this debate did not shift really at all in these polls. So I think it's important for everyone to take a step back, take a beat, Realize President Biden is the only person in this country who has defeated Donald Trump, and he will also defeat him again in November. Speaking on MSNBC's Morning Joe program, she said it's getting, in her words, a little silly here that we're talking about one night in this presidential campaign. We got to keep in mind that, sure, President Biden made it clear, didn't have his best night, but Donald Trump didn't have a good night either. And the words that came out of Donald Trump's mouth were incredibly disturbing. The way he would govern, the way he would uh, rule, you know, the the fact that he uh, wants to be a dictator on day one. He's also made it clear, Willie, we've talked about this a lot, there would be a bloodbath in Donald Trump's own words if he does not win this election. So I think we got to get back to the issues that are going to drive voters' decisions. Whether the debate really has shifted public opinion remains to be seen. So far, an average of recent polling shows only minor changes. But the pace of polling is about to pick up, and things can change quickly.
Meanwhile, a lot of Democrats feel the need for reassurance, either that Biden can win in November or that someone else will replace him at the top of the ticket. But there are those who see a different message in the debate and the reaction to Biden's performance. Democratic Senator Sheldon Whitehouse of Rhode Island says he was pretty horrified by the debate, referring to what he called the blips from President Biden and the barrage of lying from President Trump. But he does see an opportunity. I've been critical of the campaign all along, so the upside is that this could be the jolt that they need to make a more compelling case uh, against Donald Trump and for President Biden and the goals Democrats want to achieve. Reporting for Pacifica Radio News KPFA, I'm Christopher Martinez. Russian officials said today that a Ukrainian drone attack injured eight workers from the Russian-controlled Zaporizhia nuclear power plant and left a nearby town largely without power and water. In a statement on Telegram, the plant's management said that eight staff had been injured during an attack by three Ukrainian kamikaze drones on an electricity substation near the plant in southeastern Ukraine. The report could not be independently confirmed. The officials said all of the injured workers were receiving medical care. Ukrainian officials did not comment. Edward Sanovoz is the Russian-installed mayor of the nearby city of Innerhodar, where the plant's workers live. He said in a statement that the attack had left most of the city without power and water. The attack was the third of its kind within two weeks, he said, adding that work was underway to repair the damage to the substation. Israel killed a senior commander in the Lebanese militant group Hezbollah, the second top field leader killed in less than a month. The Iranian-backed Lebanese militant group said it retaliated by firing scores of rockets at Israeli military positions near the border. The Israeli military estimated that around 100 rockets were fired and said there were no reports of casualties. International diplomats are scrambling to prevent the near-daily clashes between Israel and Hezbollah from spiraling into an all-out war. That could possibly lead to a direct confrontation between Israel and Iran, which is Hezbollah's main backer. Hezbollah says it will stop its attacks once Israel agrees to a ceasefire with Hamas in the Gaza Strip. A settlement tracking group says Israel has approved the largest seizure of land in the occupied West Bank in over three decades. The group Peace Now said on Wednesday that authorities recently approved the appropriation of 12.7 square kilometers, that's nearly five square miles of land in the Jordan Valley. The group's data indicates it's the largest single appropriation approved since the 1993 Oslo Accords, at the start of the Israeli-Palestinian peace process. Palestinians view the expansion of settlements in the occupied West Bank as a main barrier to any lasting peace agreement, and most of the international community views them as illegitimate. Israel's government considers the West Bank to be the historical and religious heartland of the Jewish people and is opposed to Palestinian statehood. A controversial plan to kill a portion of one population of owls in the western U.S. to ensure the survival of another population that's threatened is bitterly dividing opinion among wildlife advocates. More from Ed Donahue. The government plans to save spotted owls by killing off other owl species. Documents obtained by the AP show the strategy by the Fish and Wildlife Service is to deploy trained shooters into dense forests along the West Coast with the goal of killing almost a half million barred owls. They are crowding a declining spotted owl population. Spotted owls are smaller and unable to compete with barred owls. The documents show the plan is to kill about 450,000 barred owls over three decades. Past attempts to save spotted owls focused on protecting the forest where they live, setting off bitter fights over logging, but it helped slow the birds' decline. The increase in the barred owl population is undermining that work. Ed Donahue, Washington. Meanwhile, a federal court in Montana has blocked the large project, which would have logged or clear-cut more than 10,000 acres of old-growth forest, threatening an endangered hawk species there. 
Mark Moran has more. In addition to logging 16 square miles, the project would have bulldozed 40 miles of new logging roads into the Little Belt Mountains. Alliance for the Wild Rockies Executive Director Mike Garrity says the decision also protects the northern goshawk, an old-growth dependent species that has declined 47 percent in the last few years. He says the bird has been under constant threat of clear-cut, which Garrity says allows competitor species to drive it out. Even though they're a fairly big bird, they can fly through very tiny openings by pulling their wings in, and they can make very sharp turns. If you accidentally come close to a goshawk nest, the goshawks are very protective of their nest, and they will attack people with their talons and poke out their eyes. Garrity says the U.S. Forest Service is required by its own rules to tell the public if the goshawk population declines by 10 percent and didn't. The Forest Service contended the horsefly project, as it is known, would not affect the goshawk population, but its own numbers showed the drastic decline in nesting sites and population. This is one in a series of lawsuits filed by a coalition of environmental advocates, including the Alliance for the Wild Rockies, to protect species habitat. Garrity says the horsefly ruling is important for the goshawk, but adds the threats don't stop there. But it's also important for other mature and old-growth forest-dependent species, such as pine marten, lynx, and forest birds, which are all in decline. The court dismissed other parts of the case, including claims that roads would interfere with grizzly bear habitat and threaten the elk population. Mark Moran reporting. Find our trust indicators at publicnewsservice.org. Indian officials said multiple factors contributed to the deadly stampede stampede in a religious festival in that country this week. Charles de Ledesma has more. Indian authorities say massive overcrowding, insufficient exits and other factors contributed to a deadly stampede at a religious festival in Uttar Pradesh state, northern India, that killed at least 120 people. Police officer Sheila Moya, on duty at the event, was injured during the chaos. She says, there was no space to keep our feet. People were moving out, stepping on others. Then suddenly people were falling. I tried to pick up some women. Sonu Kumar, a villager, helped the injured after the stampede, telling the AP, some were breathing, some were not. They were in a terrible condition. It was not immediately clear what sparked the panic. Overcrowding, poor planning and bad weather are among the factors contributing to the disaster. I'm Charles de Ledesma. The July 4th holiday means fireworks, barbecues and parades. But sadly, in recent years, it's also meant an uptick in mass shootings. Violence and mass shootings often surge in the summer months, especially around the 4th of July, which is historically one of the deadliest days of the year for shootings. A flurry of shootings around the holiday a year ago left more than a dozen people dead and over 60 wounded. Just two years ago, a mass shooting on a 4th of July parade near Chicago left seven people dead. The Gun Violence Archive classifies a mass shooting as any shooting with four or more victims, regardless of whether there were fatalities. The archive shows June, July, and August have had the highest total number of mass shootings over the past decade. Archive numbers show the lowest totals were from December through March. Independence Day topped the list with 58 mass shootings over the last 10 years, closely followed by July 5th. James Allen Fox is a criminologist and professor at Northeastern University who oversees a mass killings database maintained by the Associated Press in USA Today in partnership with the university. He said July 4th brings people together with free time and alcohol, which creates a volatile mix. In the first half of this year, there have been 14 mass shootings in the United States, with at least four fatalities, according to the database. In 2023, the nation recorded the highest number of mass shootings since tracking began with 39, Researchers and a number of facts say a number of factors play into the spike of mass shootings in summertime. Most mass shootings happen at home. In summer, school is out and families are spending more time together. Children are often home all day and there's a greater likelihood of more victims when everyone is under one roof. 
Added to that, teenagers are also, also have more idle time on their hands. Things like family reunions, block parties, and festivals in the summertime also bring more people together and create more opportunities for trouble, more so than when there's drinking involved, experts say. Also, researchers say high temperatures tend to cause more irritability and short fuses, which can lead to conflicts and violence. Added into the mix is the phenomenon, phenomenon of almost non-existent restrictions on firearms in much of the country. Governor Gavin Newsom and state legislative leaders reversed course on a plan to place an anti-retail theft initiative on the November ballot, a day after announcing it. In a statement released last night, Governor Newsom said there's not enough time for state leaders to work out final language before today's deadline. State leaders rolled out the proposed measure Sunday night after spending weeks unsuccessfully trying to negotiate a separate, more punitive proposal on the same subject off of the ballot. The unusual and abrupt move highlights state Democrats' difficult balancing act between tamping down voters' frustration on crime and avoiding a return to mass incarceration policies. State lawmakers today were expected to vote on whether to place a pair of $10 billion bonds on the November ballot. If voters approved them, the money would pay for the building of new schools and help communities prepare for the impacts of climate change. Just a few years ago, California was awash in cash as budget surpluses totaled well over $100 billion through the pandemic. But the state had to slash spending to cover deficits totaling more than $78 billion over the past two years as revenues declined amid rising inflation and an economic slowdown in the state's pivotal technology industry. Money from the bonds would be used to make up for those cuts, plus pay for a slew of priority projects up and down the state for years to come. However, the climate bond alone will cost taxpayers more than $19 billion to pay off, with annual payments of $650 million per year. That puts more pressure on the state's finances. In addition to the two statewide ballots, voters will likely be asked to approve hundreds of local borrowing proposals, including a massive $20 billion housing bond for the nine Bay Area counties. Recent history suggests voters are tiring of these bonds. In 2020, despite a history of approving statewide school bonds, voters rejected a $15 billion education borrowing proposal, what would have been the largest in the state's history. And earlier this year, voters only narrowly approved Proposition 1, authorizing the state to borrow more than $6 billion to help house the homeless. That result was widely seen as a warning for lawmakers who were considering taking on more debt. Supporters of the bonds say voters are savvy enough to recognize the need as most school facilities are built with a combination of state and local money. But demand for state dollars is so great that there's a waiting list of projects worth more than $3 billion. Much of the climate bond would go to improve water supply and help prepare for wildfires. Statewide, nearly 400 water systems don't meet state safety standards. Meanwhile, 15 of the 20 most destructive wildfires in state history have occurred in just the past decade. Heat waves are getting longer and more severe, placing public safety at risk. And intense winter storms have caused damaging floods in recent years. Governor Gavin Newsom signed the 2024 through 25 fiscal year budget this week, which, among other things, includes funds towards reparation initiatives and resources for survivors of crime, but reduces spending on prisons. It totals almost $298 billion. The budget was $16 billion and has, that is, $16 billion in spending cuts. Under the new budget, the state plans to spend up to $12 million for reparations legislation, furthering efforts to atone for a legacy of racism and discrimination against black Californians. Scott Graves is the budget director for the California Budget and Policy Center. He said that due to a challenging budget year caused by a significant revenue shortfall, the investment may not be as large as reparation advocates were hoping for.
but it is a step in the right direction in terms of uh, moving forward with uh, you know all all the the kinds of policy changes that are needed within the reparations space in California. Widespread direct payments to Black Californians are not being considered this year, but the state legislature is weighing other proposals like a formal apology, establishing an agency to administer reparations programs, and identifying families whose property was unjustly seized through eminent domain. Meanwhile, the budget also includes $50 million in flexible flexible cash assistance for survivors of crime, as well as $103 million in one-time funding for victims' services programs to fill steep federal declines. The budget project's Graves said that federal cuts left a hole of about $100 million in California services for survivors of domestic and sexual violence. It also allows continued funding towards in-home supportive services for undocumented Medi-Cal recipients. That means that undocumented Californians who are blind, disabled, or over the age of 65 um, can, uh, if their incomes are low enough, can access in-home supportive services. So that that's a, a really important uh, uh, advance that was made in the state budget. The budget maintains core investment for reducing spending on prisons. Graves said that this year's budget closes down some housing units within certain prisons rather than shutting down entire state prisons, which many advocates, including the California Budget and Policy Center, advocate. Among other budget cuts is the decision not to reinvest funding for the Children Holistic Immigration Representation Project, which has provided free legal representation and social services to hundreds of young people, The budget also delays the California Food Assistance Program expansion from 2025 to 2027, meaning that low-income older adult immigrants needing food assistance will have to wait two more years. State Republicans criticized the budget for things like temporarily raising taxes on some businesses, increasing spending in areas like high-speed rail, and setting the stage for future budget issues. They said that the budget takes money away from services for the developmentally disabled and from education reserves while spending billions from California's rainy day reserve. Graves said that after the governor's January and May budget revises faced backlash for including widespread cuts, the final budget dipped deeper into state reserves to preserve some services. I think what this budget showed was that every year state leaders have a lot of tools in the toolbox that they can use to help close a budget shortfall everything from reserves to um, taxes to delaying spending as needed making you know cuts where needed Um, there's a lot of options the budget includes an agreement that newsom and lawmakers will try to change in the state constitution to let California put more money in reserve for future budget shortfalls. Meanwhile, Pennsylvania lawmakers have missed that state's Sunday budget deadline, and the Chesapeake Bay Foundation in the state le- and the state legislature and governor are there to ensure included ed- dedicated funding. Danielle Smith reports. Since it launched in early 2023, ACAP has completed more than 280 projects statewide to reduce pollution from farming. Chesapeake Bay's Foundation Pennsylvania Executive Director Julia Crawl says the historic investment made a few years ago needs to continue. She says ACAP and the Clean Streams Fund protect every Pennsylvanian's right to clean air and water. The Clean Streams Fund helps to fund programs throughout the state that deal with agricultural practices, acid mine drainage, and stormwater runoff. And every single person in the state of Pennsylvania deals with those things around their homes, around their places of work, in their communities. Crawl points out the funding has also enabled conservation groups to develop workforce training programs, fostering a new sector of employment that supports farm conservation. At issue now is where the funding will come from. Crawl points out in the last state budget, the General Assembly used American Rescue Plan funds of $220 million to create the Clean Streams Fund, which helped the State Conservation Commission launch ACAP in early 2023. 
but that money is running out. Now it's time for the state to determine how do we make this part of the work that we're doing to protect the environment here in Pennsylvania and help to support farmers. You know, we can't wait until the funds run out. It's time for the state to act now to identify a dedicated source of funding so that all of the work that's been done to create the program doesn't just go away. Crawl as the Clean Streams Fund for ACAP offers the state's first ever agricultural cost share program. It allows farmers working through conservation districts to get funding to implement best management practices on the ground and receive technical assistance. For Public News Service, I'm Danielle Smith. Travel experts are predicting record-breaking numbers of people hitting the roads, airports, and railway stations for the July 4th holiday. They say some 71 million Americans are expected to make trips for the July 4th weekend, and 60 million of those will be traveling by car. John Trainer is a spokesman for AAA Northern California. He says there are a few things drivers can do to stay safe on the roads. What we want people to do is check out their car before they leave. You're going to pack your bag, you're going to prepare yourself, make sure you prepare your vehicle as well, especially in this high heat that we've been seeing across the West. Um, high heat does things to cars. If you have not been driving in a while, your car might not be prepared for the strain that you're going to put on it on a road trip. AAA's John Trainer says running through a maintenance checklist on your car before making a long trip is a good idea. Check your tire pressure. Make sure that your tires are not underinflated. Underinflated tires on really hot pavement can expand and cause blowouts. Very common for AAA to get that call this week. Uh, you want to check your battery level. In the West, in this heat, your battery light does not last as long as you would expect it to. Really, three years is what you get on a car battery around here. Trainer says it's also important to check and top off fluids to avoid your vehicle overheating in the warm weather. He says fuel prices have been coming down, which is likely to mean more people on the roads. Of course, airports and railway stations are likely to be very crowded. John Trainer has some tips for avoiding the long lines. Get there early. Leave earlier than usual, an hour earlier, if you can. Um, parking lot's going to be your first battle. So if you get there early, you can assure that you will get a parking spot and won't do that very nervous thing of driving around and looking for one while you know your plane is leaving um, imminently. AAA's John Trainer says another handy tip is to download your airline's app and use the digital boarding pass option and luggage check to avoid long check-in lines. And lastly, trainer suggests slowing down or moving over a lane in your car, if possible, when passing roadside accidents or stalled vehicles for an added level of safety. AAA predicts that nearly one in five Americans will drive more than 50 miles this 4th of July travel season, and the busiest airport days are expected to be today as well as July 7th and 8th. That's according to the flight website Hopper. Local flyer crews around the nation will be working to limit the number of man-made fires in what looks to be the hottest weekend of the year in much of the West. And as Mason Kennedy reports from Oregon, temperatures in that state are expected to be above average. Temperatures for the July 4th holiday are expected to be in the 90s across the state and over 100 by the weekend. In a recent wildfire briefing, the Northwest Interagency Coordination Center said its immediate focus is the July 4th holiday. Carol Connolly with the agency says they can't prevent naturally occurring wildfires, but that isn't always their biggest concern. Most of our fires in 2024 are human-caused, so that's why we're really doing a big push to reduce the risk of starting those large catastrophic fires that are preventable. People are being asked to check their local communities for the most up-to-date information on fireworks regulations and limits and also to take fire safety precautions when camping, off-roading, and cooking outdoors. Fireworks are illegal on public lands managed by the U.S. Forest Service. Connolly says that southeastern Oregon is at a high forest fire risk this season. The recent lightning storms and increased foliage growth are a potentially deadly combination. She says if the public will help by limiting man-made fires, every resource will be available when a natural fire occurs. So we're just starting to see some of that lightning on the landscape. We need our firefighters, you know, ready employees for those fires we can't prevent. 
The National Weather Service says that northwest and west central Oregon, including the Portland metro area, are under an excessive heat watch from July 4th through the 7th. I'm Mason Kennedy, Public News Service. Find our trust indicators at publicnewsservice.org. A growing wildfire today in Northern California has forced at least 26,000 people to evacuate. As of Cal Fire's last report this afternoon, the Thompson Fire had spread to 3,500 acres and was 0% contained. It's being fed by dry winds and hot weather as much as the state bakes in a historic heat wave. Scott Baba has more. The Thompson Fire broke out before noon Tuesday in and around the city of Oroville in Butte County, about 70 miles north of Sacramento. The blaze sent up a huge plume of smoke that could be seen from space overnight. Robert Carvalho is a battalion chief and spokesperson with CAL FIRE. He gave an update on the situation at 5.30 p.m. We have 3,568 acres at 0% containment. There have been no official reports on property losses, although multiple pictures from the area have shown burning structures, some residential. Carvalho said firefighters have been making steady progress against the fire. Crews uh, did a really outstanding job over the night um, on uh, trying to get a hold of the fire. Um, even though the night temperature was still warm in the mid-70s, uh, almost almost low 80s, um, they are. They they did pretty good. They did pretty good. Um, uh, from what I heard this morning, they were still doing pretty good on the northern end of the fire. They did pretty well uh, on the southern end of the fire. Uh, it's looking pretty good, but not to the point where we're going to call anything contained yet. Governor Gavin Newsom declared a state of emergency for Butte County at the request of county officials. Chris Dargan is a public information officer with the California Governor's Office of Emergency Services. Cal OES has started immediately deploying uh, resources to the area to help with the firefighting effort. Um, as of right now, we've deployed uh, more than 130 firefighting and support resources from across California to help with the firefighting effort at the Thompson Fire in Butte County. Dargan said despite improving conditions, evacuation orders will remain in effect. There are still areas of the fire that are burning and are a uh, threat to the public, so we will remain uh, with some evacuation orders and warnings for the foreseeable future, and it is our goal to get those reduced as quickly as possible and as quickly as safely to get people back into their homes. The fire's cause is still being investigated. Red flag warnings for critical fire weather conditions, including gusty northerly winds and low humidity levels, were in effect when it erupted. Much of California is currently facing record-breaking heat wave conditions, increasing the risk of fire. Takari Anderson is a meteorologist with the Sacramento Office of the National Weather Service, which tracks weather conditions for much of Northern California, including Oroville. We're seeing large swaths of area of what's considered major to extreme heat risk, meaning that anyone without effective cooling or hydration will, uh, will be affected um, and is also affecting in industries like health systems, like hospitals, health systems and industries, like outdoor workers or infrastructure. Anderson said more high temperatures above 100 degrees are forecast to continue into next week. We have excessive heat warnings out for the entirety of the Sacramento Valley and adjacent foothills, which would include that uh, Thompson Fire area. Um, we're expecting that to continue into early next week with temperatures well above 100 um, each afternoon and evening and poor overnight um, recoveries in terms of RHs and even warm temperatures in the morning as well. So just pretty a prolonged heat event. Um, exacerbating a lot of the conditions. More than a dozen other fires, most of them small, are currently active in California, according to CAL FIRE. The largest, the Basin Fire, covers nearly 22 square miles of the Sierra National Forest in eastern Fresno County, and as of last report, was 26% contained. I'm Scott Baba, Pacifica Radio, KPFA. Oakland Mayor Shing Tao today held her first extended interview since the FBI raided her home two weeks ago. Critics have called for the mayor's resignation over the ongoing federal law enforcement investigation as she faces a local recall campaign which got 40,000 signatures. The recall will be on the city's November ballot. Audie McAfee reports. 
Speaking with Bay Area's KTVU News, Oakland Mayor Shang Tao addressed a range of issues during her interview, including the FBI raid of her house last month that made national news. The embattled mayor said she could not speak on ongoing investigations, but reiterated her earlier statements that she had committed no wrongdoing. What I can say is I'm cooperating with the FBI 100%, and not just that, I am not the target. More so than that, you know, if I find any information that I can share, I'm going to be 100% transparent with the community. In addition to the FBI investigation, Tao is currently fighting off a contentious recall effort. The group Oakland United to Recall Shang Tao, or OUST, says it filed multiple ethics complaints against Oakland Mayor Tao over the past two years. Some of these violations include Mayor Tao filing her campaign papers late and coercing city employees to campaign for her during work hours on taxpayer dollars. Tao responded that she had ethics questions of her own about those pushing the recall and pointed out that there's a lawsuit against the people who are trying to recall her. Because they're refusing to work with law enforcement to really show who is actually donating money for the recall itself. And so we all should be concerned. We should all be concerned when the Public Ethics Commission has subpoena for this information, which is what they need to do, is show who is donating and uh, how much they're no donating, but they're refusing to cooperate. She says she believes these people are from Piedmont, San Francisco, or other places outside of Oakland. And that's why they want to hide their identity. Oakland Side reported that Oakland's political watchdog agency filed a lawsuit against the recall campaign. They found the majority of the campaign's financial support came in non-monetary contributions from a nonprofit political advocacy group, Foundational Oakland Unites. Seneca Scott is an organizer of Oakland United to Recall Shang Tao and a former Oakland mayoral candidate who lost to Tao in 2022. He said Oakland Side's printing of Oakland United's donor list was a form of intimidation. It didn't work. The recall's on the ballot. We made history, and we did it seven full weeks early. This is possibly one of the most successful ballot initiatives in the history of California. Scott claims that the city's Public Ethics Commission and its chief investigator, Simon Russell, has ignored its complaints about Tao's alleged ethics violations. The Wellstone Democratic Club is the largest Democratic club in the East Bay. Two weeks ago, it issued a response to the campaign for Mayor Tao's recall. It says this campaign is unfair because she is combating issues that predate her. Pamela Drake is the state and local politics coordinator for the Wellstone Democratic Club. She says residents should reconsider the recall because Mayor Tao hasn't been in office long enough to see results. I think that someone who's only been in office for barely 18 months, we have no idea really how she's going to govern. I think we should really step back and try to build a future instead of just discarding anything if it doesn't work immediately and not realize that the things we were doing before weren't working. So we have to try things a little bit differently. According to the Wellstone Democratic Club, there has been a 33 percent decrease in crime since the last year and nonviolent crimes are down by 20 percent. The election to recall Mayor Tao will be on the November 5th ballot. For KPFA, I'm Audie McAfee. The online publications 48 Hills and Mission Local are reporting that the San Francisco Police Department has increased its use of military equipment and is pushing for more. The department's annual report on its use of military equipment details the use of a long-range acoustic device for crowd control and of robotics, including spy drones, which are used to identify people with warrants out on them. The report calls for $750,000 worth of new equipment, that's according to Supervisor Dean Preston. Meanwhile, Supervisor Preston said in a statement that, quote, essential services like food for the hungry, anti-sexual exploitation programs, violence prevention, and youth programs are being cut. He called the budget for military equipment out of whack with the city's budget priorities. With school out for the summer, lots of families who depend on school lunch programs to provide nutritious lunches for their kids we're left with that option during, without that option, that is, during these months. But a new summer lunch program in Colorado is picking up the slack in that state. More from Eric Galatis. 
With school cafeterias closed for the summer, community groups and nonprofits are working to ensure that Colorado's one in five children who go without food because their family can't afford groceries can still access nutritious meals. Kristen Collins with Colorado Food Cluster says because rural families have longer distances to travel for in-person summer meal sites, her group is now delivering boxes of food directly to homes. And the box includes seven days worth of breakfast and seven days worth of lunch. All of those meals are shelf stable. So you'll get tuna packets, chicken salad packets, goldfish, juices. Collins says she expects to serve meals to 1,800 low-income kids across 20 rural counties this year. Last year, Congress exempted rural areas from rules that require summer meals to be eaten at a specific site, and there are now to-go options available outside metro areas as well. To find a summer meal near you, visit kidsfoodfinder.org. You can also text the word food or comida to 304-304. Participating community recreation centers, libraries, churches, and other sites across the state are also serving free breakfast, lunch, snacks, and supper to Colorado youths all summer long. Justice on Wordy with Colorado Blueprint to End Hunger says anyone age 18 and younger can share a meal with friends. You don't have to be enrolled in any school. You don't have to be enrolled in any type of federal or state programs. It's for anyone and everyone, and you don't even need to, like, proof of ID or anything like that. You can just show up to a site. All locations are required to meet federal nutrition guidelines. Many offer fun activities for kids and teens designed to exercise both minds and bodies to help make sure kiddos are healthy and ready to learn when they head back to school in the fall. Eric Galatis reporting. Two Civil War Union Army soldiers posthumously received the nation's highest military honor for bravery today as President Biden bestowed the Medal of Honor on them for driving a stolen Confederate locomotive across Union lines. Jennifer King reports. President Biden awards the Medal of Honor for conspicuous gallantry today to two long-dead Civil War heroes. In 1862, a troop of mostly Union soldiers who became known as Andrews Raiders hijacked a train in Atlanta and drove it north towards Chattanooga for 87 miles, cutting telegraph lines and ripping up track along the way. Army Privates Philip Shadrick of Pennsylvania and George Wilson of Ohio were executed by the Confederates, but they never got the recognition others in the group received. The exploit, nicknamed the Great Locomotive Chase, was the basis for two Hollywood movies. Jennifer King, Washington. The United Nations Human Rights Chief warned today about rising hatred and discrimination around the world in what he called a mega year for elections. He called on voters to put the rights of others in mind when they cast their ballots. Volker Turk made the call with major elections looming in places like France and Britain this week and in the U.S. and Germany later this year. He said immigrants, refugees, and other foreigners have been scapegoats for some political parties. Turk warned against making scapegoats or migrants or refugees and and asylum seekers and and minority groups scapegoats. He blasted what he called the politics of distraction and said political leaders needed to stand up against the discourse of hate. Turk noted that the U.S., India, Europe, and beyond have experienced electoral seasons that often lead to what he called a speech of hatred and dehumanization of the other. He insisted in general that there must be zero tolerance for hate speech. Arizona and Nebraska pro-choice organizers have turned in enough signatures to get abortion-related questions before their state's voters in November. Election officials must now verify them. Measures that would explicitly enshrine abortion rights are already on the ballots in five states, and voters in a sixth will consider one that supporters say would also protect the right. In Nebraska, backers of dueling amendment campaigns announced today that they turned in enough signatures. One measure would expand abortion rights. The other would keep the current ban on abortions after the first 12 weeks of pregnancy in place. Mostly clear in the Bay Area tonight, highs in the 60s and 70s. Tomorrow, things will cool off a few degrees for your Independence Day holiday, highs in the 80s. In the central San Joaquin Valley, continued hot, highs in the 80s overnight. Tomorrow, over 100 degrees. That's it for the news headline news that is this evening. I'm Max Pringle. Rod Akeel is at the controls. Good evening. <laughs> Thank you.
Hi, this is Alice Walker. In these difficult times, I can't imagine living in a world without KPFA. Please donate what you can today. Hi, this is Jeff Chang. For years, KPFA has been a beacon for all of us in times of political darkness and lack of hope. Let's stand with KPFA now. Please donate what you can today. Hi, folks. This is Rebecca Gordon. We're living through some pretty hard times these days, and I can't imagine doing it without KPFA. Please donate whatever you can today. Thank you. Donate today by calling 1-800-439-5732 or online at kpfa.org. You're listening to 94.1 KPFA, 89.3 KPFB in Berkeley, 88.1 KFCF in Fresno, and online at kpfa.org.